So we are back with some more Q&A here from our Sync Academy members. Again, this is my new feature called Jesse's Office Hours. If you are in Sync Academy, you can basically post and ask any question you have about sync licensing, maybe a personal situation, some struggle that you're personally going through. Uh, and I will do my best through these kind of uh, answer videos I put together here to address those and hopefully give you some guidance and some clarity on your journey in sync licensing. So let's go ahead and just jump right in. Joel, you have our first question here. Uh, is it a good use of time to make all of your different versions of tracks, your drum and bass, 60, 30, 15 seconds, stings, etc., in advance before submitting um, or soliciting libraries? Or should you spend that time making more main tracks, meaning the full tracks, and wait until you get specific requests before churning out all the versions? Yeah, so your second instinct there is waiting until you get those specific requests. Reason being fairly obvious that Every music library will have specific cut downs, alt versions, stems, and formats that they will require. Not, there's no universal you know, uh, type of cut downs or format that all music libraries are looking for. So library A might want exactly what you outlined there, a drum and bass, a 30, 15, um, oh, sorry, a 60, 30, 15, and a sting. Library B might want a drum and bass, a no leads, and a sting, and they don't need any of the 30, um, 60, or 15 second cut downs. So it doesn't make any sense really to do all that work up front and then submit to a library and say, well, I've already got all the deliverables, here they are. And then the library says, well, thanks, but we needed them all to be in AIF format and you did them all in waves, right? Or they say, we don't need this or this, but we do need these types of stems or cut downs. So, you don't need to do any of that work before you submit to a library. Just in your email submission to a library, just let them know, I am fully ready and available to create and deliver any um, final deliverable assets that you need, including cut downs, stems, metadata. So you basically just in your submission pitch, give a one sentence saying that I'm a professional. I know that you don't just take the full mix. I, I know and expect that there's gonna be more work needed if you take my tracks on board and I'm ready to do that as soon as you let me know what your requirements are, okay? And of course, don't send any library anything unless there's an actual contract. So they might verbally or you know in an email say, great, let's start working. Send us all your final assets. And I just personally, it's not legal advice, but it is sort of professional advice. There needs to be some sort of a written agreement between you and that library before you start sending them assets that they can actually pitch to their TV film clients because you need to make sure that you're being protected and you're gonna be getting paid for the work that you're doing, okay? All right, Ed, next question. I've had a few libraries tell me that when I asked them what kind of music to send them, uh, the answer was to write what you do best and like. Uh, reference tracks weren't on the top of their list as was giving them what I can do with my music in my style. So I'm, I'm confused a little about trying, uh, I think you're meaning that I try to tell you guys to use reference tracks all the time and I do obviously still stand by that. One library accepted my album and I didn't use any reference tracks except on a broader level in general. So it's a great question, Ed. So this is not an either or proposition though, okay? So when you ask the library, what should you send them? And they said, well, just give us what you do best. You can do what you do best while also using reference tracks. This is what I'm telling you guys to do all the time. So it's not an either or, like either you just write music that comes to your mind or you go to a music library and just completely follow a type of track that you're not really into or a type of music you're not really into. No, you need to be doing both of those things. Like if you're into rock music, for example, let's say, then you can go find some great, energetic, exciting, uh, inspirational rock music from a music library and use those tracks as your reference tracks with music that you love. So I'm, I understand you got accepted by a library without using any reference tracks, and that's great. I want to know how many placements you're gonna be getting. So one thing I will say, especially if you are newer to this uh, industry, creating something that's licensable by accident when you've never had really any experience in this industry is very unlikely. Okay, I'm gonna put it at less than 10% chance that if you kind of just are getting your foot into music libraries for the first time and you're not using reference tracks, you just, you're just composing from wherever your heart is telling you to compose, right? you probably have a less than 10% chance that you are creating something that is licensable, that is useful, that is serviceable for a, uh, a TV film production music library's clients, okay? This is why I'm telling most of you guys that are in the beginning stages of this industry, don't, don't suffer that way. This is what I did, okay? So I did use some reference tracks in the beginning, but a lot of times I just kind of went with wherever my creative flair was going, and I paid a price for that because later on, sure, I got my tracks into a library as you did, 
but I had all, most of those tracks sitting on the library's shelf, never getting placements to this day, probably 70 to 80% of those early tracks that I was making never got the light of day. So getting accepted into a library is important, but it's not the entire story. Getting accepted into a library with licensable, useful, serviceable tracks, that's really what I'm coaching you guys to do. That's really where the power is and what I'm trying to um, educate you guys on, okay? So do both. Follow your heart, go with those genres that you feel that you love, exactly what that library told you, that is great advice, and use reference tracks in that same genre. So you can do both. All right, Alan has a question here. I have one of my songs accepted into a top tier library as a non-exclusive. This is because I re uh, received a referral from an industry professional. At the time, I was not familiar with metadata. I have tried to contact the library, but have not gotten a response. Any suggestions? Ooh, that's, that's not fun. Um, also, I have submitted two songs to several libraries that are very similar in the style of the songs that they already have. However, I've not gotten any response. I have other songs, but not in the styles they are looking for. Okay, so let's go to the first one. So reaching out to a library that you've already gotten a track accepted by and they're not responding to you not great sorry to hear that it definitely happens you're not the only one that that's happened to um chances are if it's a legitimate top tier library they're pretty they're pretty busy as a non-exclusive you know i'm not sure which library this is non-exclusive libraries the problem with them is because they're non-exclusive they have a large volume of composers and producers that are just throwing them a bunch of music because they don't have to be exclusive so Chances are getting personal one-on-one -on -one time with a company like that is very, very tough. So I don't know. If I were in your shoes, this is not advice, but if I were in your shoes, if it was just one track and it was a library that was sort of not getting back to me, I would just move on. It's just one track. Uh, and Alan, you're probably going to be in this business for a long time and you're going to compose hundreds of tracks over the course of your career. So one track is not going to make or break your entire career. So it might just be one of these situations where it's a lesson learned. Maybe non-exclusive is not where you want to go in the future. I've, I've talked to you guys about that in many of my videos. Non-exclusive, one of those problems is it's just you don't get that personal, direct, intimate connection where if you need to get a question answered you probably it's going to be tougher to get somebody on the phone or to answer an email so maybe you just need to move on now i know you're now moving on you submitted two songs to several libraries okay here's the issue with this alan two songs again not really going to cut it anymore these days when i started my youtube channel and sync academy back in what 2016 was the youtube channel sync academy is 2018 you might be able to get the attention of a library with two to five songs, sort of showing them what you can bring to the table that could get you under contract, and then you finish out in a full album. Those days are done. I'm telling you guys, those days are over. These days, you need to come to a library with 10 tracks, at least 10, ideally 12, and that's because that's really what a full album would be, and you're basically telling a library, listen, you don't have to even hold my hand through this process. You can basically take these tracks today. They're ready to go and put them in front of your clients literally tomorrow if you want to. So you're giving them a finished product. You're giving them basically the full car as opposed to, well, here's a transmission, here's four wheels, here's an axle, uh, give me a couple of months and I'll get you the rest of the car. That's what you're doing when you're coming to them with two songs or five songs. But when you come to them with 10 songs, 12 songs, they're all in one complete like genre, one focused place, you're giving them the final product, the finished car, the full thing that they can take into that catalog. So my advice to you is don't pitch anymore until you get a full album in one genre in one direction ready to go ready to be licensable and we have tons of tutorials in sync academy to help you uh, do just that so i wish you all the best alan i know it's tough but i think you got a little bit of work ahead of you before you keep submitting all right emil um i was wondering if i have five tracks ready to get pitched can i then send the same tracks to multiple libraries this would be a first submission audition kind of scenario thanks uh great question very connected to what we've been talking about already uh you can only send the same tracks to multiple libraries if those multiple libraries are all non-exclusive very very important distinction you need to keep in mind okay if they're exclusive meaning that they want to have full and complete uh, control over distributing your music to the TV and film industry, then no, you can definitely not take the same five tracks, send it to one exclusive library, and then send it to another, and send it to a third one, and just keep getting your con your tracks out there. Um, no exclusive library will ever be comfortable with that. I'll just tell you that right off the bat. What they might be comfortable with, you know, 50% of the time of them, they might be comfortable with you distributing those tracks let's say on like spotify or apple music or online and some social media presence like if you want to actually create some public awareness of your music 
I'd say 50% of those exclusive companies will be okay with that, but you definitely need to tell them. You need to be transparent and let them know that's what you want to do. Don't let them find that out on their own and you just sort of didn't say that because if they're not comfortable with that and they find out that your tracks are on Spotify or somewhere else online, they can just pull your tracks right out of their, their album or they'll just say, you know, we're not working with you anymore because you sort of didn't tell us the full truth of what your situation was. So you could really destroy a lot of relationships by being not transparent. So definitely just let them know what you want to do. But yeah, you got to make sure that when you're submitting to exclusive libraries, pick the one that you want to. And again, five tracks, I wouldn't do it. I don't think five tracks is as impressive and as licensable and as ready to go as 10. So I would spend some time, that would be my advice for you. Spend some more time, get it up to 10. You know, you've probably got five great tracks. What's another five? You've got a couple of weeks, probably maybe a month. Get those extra five. Now you have a full solid album. It's a full finished product ready to be pitched to an exclusive library. So I would definitely um, go in that direction. All right, Miguel, I've been feeling, um, I've been lately feeling burnout from trying to make albums to pitch the libraries. I'm starting to get overwhelmed and maybe I put too much pressure and doubts on myself. Probably because we all do. Miguel, you're definitely in good company here. Uh, what do you do if you ever start feeling this way or what can I do to break out from the slump I'm currently in? Totally get it, Miguel. Thank you for being just vulnerable, being honest about where you're at in your scenario and in your career. We've all been there, okay? So you are in good company. You've definitely, um, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, okay? The biggest thing I want to sort of help you right now with, and this is what I tell everybody who feels this, is a lot of times we feel like, you know, you've, you're, you're feeling overwhelmed, um, you're feeling burned out. Uh, you probably have a lot of pressure that things need to go a certain way or that there's sort of anxiety of like, maybe I won't get accepted. And a lot of times we think because we're having all these really difficult feelings and uh, and questioning ourselves that we maybe won't succeed because we feel that, well, somebody who's successful will just always be dead set determined that things are going to work out and they're never going to feel self-doubt and they'll never face rejection and they're no, they'll never feel overwhelmed because they just know they're going to succeed. So the fact that I'm feeling all these things uh, means that I probably won't do well and this is just not the right fit for me. This is what I want to try to break. That Just, just that whole frame right there. I need to break that as, as, as much as I possibly can for you. Zoom out a little bit. You need to remember that myself, I've been doing, I had been doing sync licensing for, I don't know, was it 13 years, 12 years when I basically started to transition into really focus just on sync my music and the educational stuff that I do. But in all of that time, I felt like I didn't belong. I felt like a fraud. I felt like I maybe I'm not as professional as the other producers that are in this business. I got rejected by libraries. I got passed over by tons and tons of custom opportunities that I spent hours and hours and hours on music, not getting paid for any of the work, right? For demo, like putting together demos and submissions that never made the light of day and I never made money on and feeling like I wasted tons and tons of time. What I want you to take away from all that is that in my career, I consider my career very successful that was all included in a successful career. Feeling rejected, feeling burned out, feeling like I didn't belong, feeling like I'm overwhelmed, feeling like I'm putting too much pressure on myself, feeling like all of these things, all of that was a part of my journey. So just remember that that's why this business is tough. And it's not really just this business, but anything in life that's really difficult and not many people do well at it, which I think sync licensing would qualify for that, it's just going to be difficult. You're just going to have moments and times where you feel like it's too hard, it's too tough, and there's too many obstacles in your way to be able to get through them for whatever you're dealing with. Whatever those obstacles are, they can be overcome. I don't care what, how big they seem, how large those mountains in front of you feel. They all can be overcome because I see them being overcome by many of the producers and students that I've coached and I've seen them in my own life. Definitely feeling like I can't get through certain things and realizing afterwards, wow, I really could, but it just didn't feel like that way in the moment. So step one is for sure talking about this, sharing with us here in Sync Academy. That's a really great first step because you'll realize very quickly, I see you got some replies already that people are going to resonate with you and they're going to let you know, hey, you're, you're, you're in the right crowd. You're, you're in the right place. We've all felt that at some point. Secondly, I would say because you're in Sync Academy, you need to go check out the Sync Psych tutorials, okay? So I have a Sync Psych 101 tutorials. There's like nine or 10 of them, and they're all about mindset. So they're not about technical skills. They're not about your DAW. They're not about even really sync licensing in terms of the technical knowledge you need to know about how to succeed, but it's all about getting the storylines right in here about how you're thinking about yourself, how you're thinking about your career, what what maybe unconscious frames you're putting on your trajectory in this in this uh, business and in your life. Um, this is the important stuff. Uh, all the technical knowledge, all the stuff, all the other things that we're kind of talking about in this video, 
certainly are important, but all that sort of nonsense and doesn't matter at all if internally there's a self-sabotage program running, which I know a lot of is, is happening for a lot of you guys and not even maybe consciously aware of it, but there could be some sort of you know, self-defeating um, self-talk going on that's going to basically constantly get in your way and not allow you to get through to wherever you want to get to in this business. So definitely check out Sync Psych 101 in our Sync Academy tutorials. That's going to be a huge, huge part of it. And reach out and just keep reaching out to us here on the platform and talk about how you're feeling and what you're doing. We definitely want to be positive and solution oriented here in Sync Academy, but we also want to be honest and vulnerable about how hard and tough and just how much of a struggle this really this business really can be. Um, that's why I created really everything that I created because I know how hard it is to be in the middle of this industry and feel alone and feel like you're you're giving up and also feeling this sunk cost of like, well, I've already put in so much time and energy and, and months and years into this business. I can't get out now, but I don't see a future, so I feel completely stuck. We all have felt that way. We've all been there. So definitely uh, keep doing what you're doing, Miguel. Just reach out, keep um, letting us know where you are and check out those tutorials. I think you'll find some help um, there. All right, uh, Justin, what is the difference between a placement and a sync? Uh, how does this relate to music libraries versus sync agents? So, you know, these are kind of all terms that sometimes get interchanged. Um, you know, the way that I see, I mean, those are basically kind of, when I, when I hear the word sync, I think of there's, a, there's a, um, an upfront payment, right? So there's going to be a sync fee associated with a particular placement. A lot of times you can get placements through music libraries and there are no upfront sync fees at all. They're basically part of a blanket agreement with that library. So a client, let's say a reality TV show, you know, comes and takes 100 tracks for a couple of their episodes. They're not paying every single time they take one of those tracks. A lot of times they will be paying the library a blanket fee to get access to all of them. Or sometimes there's no fee at all in the library saying, hey, we just want you to use tons of our music. We're going to collect all, everything on the back end. The library takes the publisher side and our composer will take their writer share. So I, I think a lot of these terms sort of, it depends on who you're talking to and in what context, but that's kind of how I see it because definitely a placement can have a sync. Uh, or, or a placement can ha cannot have a sync fee, right? And usually a sync would be more of something that if it's just, if people are usually saying like, oh, I got a sync placement. A lot of times it's probably referring it to, you know, something that got paid an upfront fee. Okay, sometimes that can be a custom opportunity where you, compost, you, you uh, customize some music just for that opportunity, like an ad, like a commercial, or it could be a pre-made piece of music that you just fit into an opportunity and you got paid for it. So these are kind of interchangeable terms. And then how does this relate to music libraries versus sync agents? Well, sync agents for the most part are only gonna be dealing with placements that get you that one-time upfront fee. Libraries sometimes can, I've definitely earned many of those with the libraries I've worked with, but a lot of what libraries do is not involving the upfront sync fee. A lot of it is going to be either the blanket fee, like I said, or actually even no fee upfront. They just wanna get as much music on the air as they possibly can as a sort of a business strategy because they know that they can recoup and collect uh, that income in passive income royalties through performance rights organizations, which I'm actually a big fan of. Sync fees have been a smaller part of my income. It's those performance rights um, uh, royalties that really actually made a bulk of my income in my sync licensing career. So hopefully that uh, clarifies that a bit. Uh, Tyrone, uh, in sync agreements with music libraries, is it permissible to operate under registered business such as a single member LLC and use its EIN instead of a social security number? Absolutely. You can definitely with any library you're working with say, hey, I'm not operating as an individual. I'm actually operating as an LLC. Basically, all that's going to mean is when they send you a check, let's say they give you consideration fees or you earn a sync fee or something like that. Just let them know when you send me a check, you're basically going to be sending it to this company name using this EIN um, or if it's a direct deposit, you definitely want to have a different um, checking account. You want to have a business checking account. So that when I do that direct deposit, it's going into a separate account, not your personal one. So I, I, I'm not going to get into all the specifics of how to basically run a clean LLC company, but there are definitely some common sense things to make sure that how things are being run, it's it's being run properly as a business. But absolutely, you can do that with a library. They'll. I don't think there's been any library I've ever heard of that just wouldn't accommodate a, a composer like that. They can absolutely do that. Just make sure that you tell them and get all your information ready to go. Uh, Sean has a question. If you could go back in time to when you started your sync career, what advice would you give yourself? Wow, Sean, great question. And it's actually a YouTube video that I've been wanting to make for a while. And maybe I'll sort of clip this out and just make it its own. But, you know, I, I think of, I've been thinking about this lately is, and I want to go one step further than your question. So I want to think about if I had to start over in sync licensing right now, and I didn't have Sync Academy, Sync Edge, Pro Feedback, or even let's say my YouTube channel, if there was just nothing really online, 
what would I do today? You know, 2023, how would I get started? I think the biggest thing that I would do is, because I'm more of a self-starter. I want to go find things out for myself. I want to go directly discover what's going on in a particular industry and field. I don't want somebody, you know, claiming to know a lot about it to tell me about it. I really want to go look for myself. So what I would do is basically just look up how does TV, how does music get placed into TV shows, right? If that's what I wanted to learn about. Well, I'm sure there'd be a couple of articles, maybe some PROs, ASCAP or BMI has something. Somebody has posted something about like, oh, there's this thing called production music, right? I'm like, hmm, production music, okay. Wow, how do you get started with that? And then I'll learn about production music libraries. Okay, and I just put out this um, tutorial a couple of weeks ago about how to find production music libraries on your own. So I'll go to Google, production music libraries for TV film. How, what do I find? And then I'm doing research, right? And I'm gonna go find out who are these companies, who do they service? Um, I'll go check out their catalogs. I'm gonna listen to the music. I'm gonna say, hmm, what kind of music do they have? And then I'm basically, I think what I would do is just constantly A, B compare the music that they're shopping and that they're already hosting to what I compose at my home studio. And I'm gonna to try to be honest, real honest with myself is what I'm doing good enough? Am I really, you know, creating something that could be useful for them? And would I actually get accepted? And then I would basically just create a good, a good chunk of music and start pitching it to these libraries and seeing what sticks, what gets accepted, what doesn't. And through a trial of error, I would start to figure out basically how to get into these companies. And I think that's really my personal style for how I would have gotten to this business. Now, if you guys don't know my backstory, I actually got introduced into a music library owner who basically gave me quite a bit of coaching and guidance and actually even hooked me up with, with sounds and plugins and lots of great stuff, actually. So he was a real valuable asset for me getting started. But if I didn't have any of that, I think for me, like what better place to go figure out what works in this business than to go right to a library, right to their catalog, listen to their music and really try to sort of emulate the best that I can to create a licensable product. And that's what I've been telling you guys to do. Essentially, I do have a lot of obviously coaching services, feedback services, tutorials, YouTube videos, a lot of stuff. But really when it comes down to it, nothing's going to teach you guys better than going right to a music library website, right to their catalog and listen and use your own ears and really start to compare how they're producing, how they're structuring, how they're mixing, how they're mastering how their music sounds versus what you are doing. So you're basically trying to every single day close that gap a little bit so by the time you're ready to go, you've got an amazing product and then you pitch it off to these libraries directly. So it would be a lot more lonely without Sync Academy. It would be a lot more feeling like I would just, you know, I'm doing things on my own and I remember feeling that way a lot back then. Um, but that's my best sort of suggestion for you guys right now. If, if I had to start over today, I would wanna go right to the source. I wanna go find directly what's going on in this business and what music is getting placed and do my best essentially to try to serve that industry. All right, guys, so we're gonna take a, pay, uh, a break there and I will continue and come back with the rest of these questions in our part two video of Jesse's Office Hours. Thank you guys so much for submitting your questions. I hope you found my answers helpful and inspirational and um, just useful in some way.